in search. Um, they really let you put some of Google's user interface into your websites. Uh, AdWords, gadgets, checkout. Uh, we really run the gamut. Uh, we're trying to create programmatic access to as many of our applications as possible, uh, desktop. So today we're going to be talking about Google Data APIs. Uh, here it says they are full fidelity data APIs. So what that means is um, for each API, uh, for each Google data service, say calendar, blogger, spreadsheets, uh, we want to provide all the functionality that you have in the user interface uh, just through this API. Uh, so you can have programmatically update, create, modify, any sort of data. So the Google Data APIs, we started releasing them about a year ago. Uh, we've had a lot of good feedback. Um, here's kind of a high level vision for what GData can be. Um, because we have so much structured data at Google, uh, it's a great place to incubate this sort of standard data protocol. Um, we, just, we have such a wide range of information. Uh, and the GData protocol allows you to access all that different information uh, from one protocol. Um, we also, because there's so many users, when you start developing applications that use the GData API, you tap into a huge user base. So it's a great opportunity for you as developers uh, to, to just get a lot of uh, exposure. So we also get you know, some more interesting feedback like this. Um, just because it's cool, you put something out there and all of a sudden you, you, you've built an application that millions of people can use. Uh, so the goals of GData uh, really are in alignment with Google's overall goals of um, organizing the world's information and making ex it accessible. Uh, as I talked about a little bit, the Google data services, things like Google Base, Calendar, Spreadsheet, users, there's millions of users of this information. They've created so much content there, uh, and Google's structured it a little bit, but mostly it's you know, put there by the users. And so GData, we aim to uh, enable as many Google applications as we can with these APIs. And then you know, once you have a service that has a, an API, it doesn't necessarily, you know, nobody's, the users aren't necessarily going to hit it. It's the developers like you that are going to write applications that access these endpoints. And so we want to enable you to write those applications. So we support uh, several client libraries. Uh, here I have the, the five. <coughs> Most popular ones, Java, Python, .NET, PHP. Objective-C is a new one. Uh, but also, uh, developers have contributed their own client libraries. So there's a great community building around these APIs. And it's, it's great to see that you know, if we don't offer what you need or your favorite programming language, uh, developers are just building it themselves in the community. So what is the GData API? Uh, in, in short, it's a REST-based protocol for uh, modifying, creating, deleting data. Uh, it's based on the Atom Publishing Protocol. And it's, it's a simple format. It's based on standards. And it uses XML uh, in the Atom syndication format. However, that's not quite enough for most of our services. Um, obviously, we have more extensive data. Uh, things like base and calendar, you need more information than just you know, authors and content. Uh, so we've, we've created some data models uh, as extensions to the APP. Uh, also concurrency, uh, because these are uh, distributed applications, you know, my third party application and your third party application might be accessing the same user's data and we have to manage the conflicts or avoid them as best we can. Uh, querying. I mean, we're Google, we love to index data and then query it. So we have a number of ways that you can query information once you've used the, the APIs to put it in the system. And then lastly, authentication. Obviously, uh, privacy is a big issue. All this data, a lot of it is personal information, but we still want to enable your applications to access users' data. Uh, so we have a couple of schemes for authentication. And I'll, I'll talk in more in depth about each of those. Uh, so first, let's just take a look. Um, this great slide of XML here. Uh, what I want you to take away here is highlighted in blue are just some standard APP elements of a general, this is a GData representation of a calendar event. Okay, so we have uh, an ID so the server can index it. 
uh, publish date, updated, title, content, author. This is all standard APP stuff. Um, but for a calendar event, you need more information. You need to know when, it's gonna, when the event is taking place, uh, if there's attendees, and then also some elements from the user interface. Uh, so here in this slide, I've, I have these things highlighted in red. And this is where we start to get into the data, the data structures that we've built in as extensions. Uh, so this first line here, uh, out, it's an example of uh, GData kind. So we've created a few kinds uh, as we've uh, developed for the various data services and seen some commonalities. So in this case, we have an event kind. And that'll let you, as a programmer, know what sort of information to expect. Uh, so that's denoted in the first line. Uh, then, as I said, you know, there's information about when the event takes place, um, even some information for the UI, such as visibility. Uh, you can set colors and things like that through the API. OK, so the next thing I want to talk about is concurrency. Um, this is kind of a model of, of you know, how we handle it, but I want to talk about what the problem is exactly. So um, let's say that I have a third party application, and we're accessing someone's calendar. And I pull down an event, you know, say for this presentation. Um, and I want to change the title. I'd maybe tweak the topic a little bit. Uh, and then another client application pulls down that same event, and they're going to change the time. They're rearranging the order. So now when I post my uh, updated event back, it's going to have the new title. Uh, when they post their updated event back, it has a new time, but still the old title. Right? So if we just took what they posted, my data would be gone. My changes would be gone. Uh, so to avoid that, we use something called optimistic concurrency. And basically, it's just a way of versioning these updates and entries as they come in. So let's say first uh, we do a git uh, on the element, and we receive a 200 OK and the entry itself in the message body. Uh, part of what we'll receive is an edit link. And this edit link uh, is pretty important as we'll go forward here. Uh, it contains an ID for the element, but also a version. In this case, it's just the first version. Right? Uh, when I make a modification and I do a put, I'll receive back from the server uh, a mo what the server's version of that entry. And the server, in this case, is going to update the version. Okay? So now if another application that had version 1 tries to, know, uh, to put that information it's going to get a conflict because it has an, a stale version number. So this is just a simple way to avoid these conflicts. Um, in the case that you did get a conflict, you'd then need to get, uh, perform a git on the server, and then you would get the most up-to-date version. Then you can make your changes and submit them again. OK, so here's um, just a number of ways that we can query information once it's uh, indexed. Um, the first one is just a full text search. This is similar to what you would see if you're just typing something into the Google search box. Uh, it's going to search any indexed information, the content, title, uh, any of the extension tags that you have in there. The second is a concept of categories. So this takes different forms in the different data services. So this example here is for Google Base, uh, which is uh, a large, people use it mostly for products. Uh, but you can use it for vehicles, might be a category, housing. It's just a way to uh, stream, uh, filter out a lot of the information. So then you can uh, add additional query parameters to just vehicles or just housing or jobs. Um, on the other hand, in Blogger, uh, you can label your blog posts, and that's interpreted in GData as a category. So then you can search through the categories queries just through certain labels of posts. Then there's also some standard uh, query parameters that you can use because it's based on Atom. So we index based on updated time and published time. So all the, G, all the G data services uh, will allow things like updated searches, uh, searches on the updated date. Uh, but then specific applications uh, might have specific query parameters that are more important or appropriate. So spreadsheets, you may want to query just based on a range of rows in your spreadsheet. Uh, calendar, maybe based on the starter end time. Uh, obviously, that's not going to be appropriate to some other applications. Uh, but it shows the extensibility of G data and you know, from what you can store and how you can search for it. And the final type of query parameter that you can add is uh, what kind of data is returned. So by default, you're going to receive a, a G data feed back. 
but you could also specify to receive JSON back. So if you have a JavaScript application, you can make a query and receive your information back as a JavaScript object. Um, and also, RSS is supported. Uh, if we decide to support more output formats, this is just a standard way to access them. OK, so now that we have all those elements of a GData feed, you know, what can we do with it? How do we use it? Uh, this slide just kind of goes over the, the REST-based uh, attributes of the GData protocol. Uh, and how do you do your basic CRUD operations on data? Um, so this example, again, uses Blogger. Uh, if you want to create a blog entry, you just send a post to your Blogger, your blog feed. So one user might have uh, multiple blogs, uh, and it's just specified here by the blog ID. And you send a post with your message in the body of the HTTP message, and your blog will appear. Your blog entry will appear. Then once you have blog entries and then you want to query them, you just send a git to the server. Uh, and you can add any sort of query parameters that we just saw to the end of the URL. Um, to update any information, again, we have the blog ID and then uh, entries each will be given a post ID. Uh, and you can just send a, a put to the, sp to the specific post ID um, with your updated information in there. And then lastly, to delete things, um, you can just send, again, this is the edit URL that we saw earlier, and we'll, we'll see that come up again. Um, to delete, you just send a delete HTTP message to the URL. So I want to take a little bit closer to the look at these uh, requests and responses. So this is the first one, just to post a new entry. Um, you, the URL of your feed, and you have the content. Uh, in this case, it's, this is just purely Adam. Uh, there's no GData extensions here at all. Uh, author, title, content. And what you receive back from the server then, if it's successful, you get a 201 created message, uh, all just standard HTTP. Uh, but what you'll see here is that the server's inserted some information. It's given it an ID. It's given it this edit link that we talked about uh, with an ID for the element and also a version ID for the concurrency. Uh, and then when the server actually published it, and since it was just created, the updated date is also the same. Okay, so let's say now we want to query that feed. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but the, the post that we just created, the author's name was Elizabeth Bennett. So we'll just add a Q equals Bennett and search for any entries by that author or that have, uh, that mention that author or that word at all. Uh, so we just send a git to the URL of the feed with our query parameters. We'll receive back a 200 OK. And in this case, we'll get an entire feed. Uh, I think this is my first example that shows the entire XML. So the root element is a feed. And you have some information about the feed itself. Uh, in this case, since it's a blog, the title is the name of the blog, uh, the last updated time, uh, the author of the blog. Uh, but then you'd also receive a list of entries uh, within that XML. And th these are the entries that we've been looking at before. We see uh, edit link, published author, title. Now, if we want to modify that, once we've gotten it back, we can read it from the uh, body of that message. And we can make a change. In this case, you know, we're just going to clearly make some, some update to the content. Uh, and then we just send a put uh, to this edit URL that, we've, that we parsed out of the entry. Uh, make sure that we have the right version for, con for concurrency's sake. And what we'll receive back from the server then is a 200 OK. We'll see that we have an updated edit link with the new version, and also a new updated time whenever the server actually <coughs> processed that change. And here we'll see we have the most current version of the entry. And then we can also use that edit link to delete entries. Right? This slide makes it look almost too simple. <laughs> um, but all you need to do is send a delete HTTP message to the edit link of that, for that entry, and you'll receive a 200 OK indicating that the entry was deleted. OK, so, so the extension I haven't talked about yet was, is authentication. Uh, we have a couple of methods for authentication based on what type of application you're writing. Uh, the first is for applications that you would install and run from your computer. Um, these are basically you know, things you would download and run a setup.exe. Um, this method's called, uh, we call it client login. 
Um, and basically, the goal of both of these authentication schemes is to get a token, an authorization token back from Google. Um, in the case of an installed application, the user will just enter their Google credentials into your application, and then you'll forward those credentials to the uh, client login service. And if they're valid, then you'll receive an authorization token. Then you take that authorization token, and in all of your subsequent HTTP messages, the puts, the gets, um, you'll just re uh, add that HTTP header to your message that you're sending. Okay. In the case of web applications, we can actually be a little more savvy, and we'll f we actually have you forward your users to Google's website. So they're only ever app entering their Google credentials at google.com. This way, they don't need to worry about entering their Google credentials into your third-party application. So we'll have uh, you forward your users to our AuthSub service. This is called AuthSub. Uh, they'll log in. They'll be you know, asked if they want to grant you permission to access their calendar, their blog, whatever. And after they log in and agree to let you have access, we'll forward them back to your web application. Uh, so they never had to you know, enter their credentials anywhere other than Google. OK, so here's another list of the GData services. Um, it, it's a pretty long list. Uh, it's more than just Calendar and Blogger. I know I've been using those examples a lot. Um, and the list keeps growing. As I said, the goal is really to enable as many of our services as we can. Um, another thing that's cool about this list and GData itself, it's you know, the one single protocol allow you to access all of these different services. So creating mashups between any of these becomes really simple because you're using just one, one API to access these different services. So let me just show a quick example of uh, a mashup between Google Spreadsheets and Google Calendar. This, by the way, is uh, code.google.com slash APIs. This is where you'll find all the APIs that everyone's talking about today. Uh, just got a facelift, so it might look a little different if you've seen it before. Um, OK, so here's our example. Uh, this is just a spreadsheet. It just has data in it. Right? This isn't really that, inf that interesting yet. Um, you know, it just has some birthdays, Al Einstein, Linus Torvalds, and Eric Schmidt, uh, and then a, a URL to a picture of this person. <coughs> Uh, and so we want to make this a little more useful for, for our users so we can, uh, we, I have a little example program that's also available for download within the client library that's going to read this information and post it to my calendar. <coughs> so here's my calendar here. Uh, so let's run it here. Um, this example is written using the Python client library. And if you go to code.google.com, you can find our client libraries, and this is available in the downloads. So, um, so this is kind of an example of one of these installed applications. This is obviously just a little script, but it's going to use client login. So it's going to ask me to uh, give it my username and password. So. Okay, and if I didn't mistype that, the first thing it's going to do is query the Spreadsheets API for any spreadsheets that I have access to, that this user has access to. I actually have three. Uh, one is the birthdays that I showed you and just a, a couple others. Um, so I'll, I'll select the birthdays one, because the other ones don't have any useful data for this application. Um, and then uh, among a, a spreadsheet, you can have multiple worksheets. Um, and so there's also a feed for querying the different worksheets. Uh, in this case, there's only one, though. OK, so it takes a moment here. Uh, or it just crashes all together. All right, you got to love live demos, right? Maybe we can just try it again. What kind of error did we get here? So a 404. Let's try it again. It looks like I had a redirect error. Let me see. This may actually, let me just delete. 
delete these. This application will actually <coughs> update these. Uh, maybe I have some stale information. Here. Or maybe it's out of date. Yeah. Okay, maybe this is my problem, a bad internet connection here. Um, let's just try and run it one more time just for, for kicks. Maybe we'll see something happen here. Uh, two. Everyone cross their fingers for me here. <laughs> Uh, actually, I'm wired in, oh, okay. so uh, unless unless my <laughs> yeah, okay, great. <laughs> so uh, obviously, there's some issues that programmatically you'll have to work around as you're developing with these things because internet connections aren't always reliable, right? Um, so then, hopefully, we can go here now. Look at my calendar. It's updated them all. So. The reason I wanted to show this example, it shows a cool feature of the calendar uh, API that's fairly new. Um, okay, so this is, uh, this is my event. Uh, the type of event I added here was a web content event. And this is kind of cool. We, I talked about how the Ajax APIs let you put Google's UI on your website. Uh, web content lets you do the opposite. It lets you add your own HTML to Google's website. So. Um, in this case, it was just a, you know, an image link, but you could add any of your HTML and it'll come in this pop-up div here. Uh, so this is a, a new feature that is kind of exciting to see. You know, I'm anxious to see how you guys are all going to use this. Um, there's a lot of opportunity. Um, and you can, you know, like I said, it's a, a chance for you to put your, your mark on the Google interface. OK, so let me get back to my slides here. Thanks for bearing with me through that false, false attempt there. <laughs> okay, um, so there's, there's some APIs or some Google services that aren't in this list yet, and that's you know, clear. Um, what I encourage you to do is to join some of our discussion groups and request those features, requ request those new services. Uh, we need to know what you guys want to build. What, what do you need access to? What data do we have that, that you want so that we can uh, spend our effort making the most valuable uh, solutions for you. Um, so here's a little bit about developer support. Um, certainly this talk is probably not enough to get you just up and running and you're all going to go develop your applications during the next session. So we have the client libraries that I talked about. Um, if your favorite one isn't there, you know, there's some contributed ones and you can always roll your own. Um, and then there's a, there's a great community growing around the Google Data APIs, uh, the forums. They're all Google groups. Uh, if you just go search uh, the Google groups, you'll find them. Or from code.google.com, if you look at the API page for a specific service, you'll find the group for that service. There's also a Google Data blog that you should all, you know, if you want to get involved with this, subscribe to that. We'll let you know events, but also you know, new versions of the client libraries and new documentation when it comes out. We'll announce it on there and keep you up to date or when new client libraries are supported. Um, and then on code.google.com, we also have a knowledge base of basically troubleshooting things. Uh, if you're getting a, that 404 error, you know, why did I get it? What could have gone wrong? What should I do to fix it? And then also developer guides, um, which we've recently kind of revamped. They used to be fairly, uh, I don't know, maybe one-dimensional. They had some, some XML in there. and mostly Java examples. Uh, we've now uh, tried to expand them to cover all of our supported client libraries. So if you're using um, the .NET platform, you can, there's examples of all the CRUD operations already there for you, uh, sample code and everything on there. And we're always adding content there. Uh, we get a lot of our direction from the groups. Uh, if there's bugs that come up in the groups, we try to address them in the knowledge base. Uh, and then also demand for new client libraries or better documentation for the client libraries. We really uh, look to the groups a lot for that sort of feedback. 
So uh, a lot of the developers that are in the groups, they've come up with all sorts of applications. Um, these are just a few. Uh, the ambient clock is a pretty popular one to, to integrate with Google Calendar and kind of give you your, your day on an analog clock there. Uh, Fixer online photo editor uh, downloads your pictures from Picasso Web using the data API and lets you modify them and then uh, upload them again. Uh, then uh, there's a kind of a mashup with spreadsheets and calendar that does timesheets. Uh, obviously, there's some you know spreadsheet-like information that's also time-oriented. And uh, there's just so many applications out there. We're always featuring new ones on code.google.com, and you know we love to see just the, the great new ways that you guys are all using this information. Um, so I already showed the birthday reminder. I have another kind of cool mashup. Uh, it actually is mostly written in, in JavaScript, so it, it uses the JSON feedback. Um, and it's a, a mashup between spreadsheets and the Maps APIs. Uh, not only can, you know, obviously you can mash up all of our APIs and someone else's just to create a cool application. So let's just bring it up here. So here again, this spreadsheet, I mean, it's just data. It's, this is basically a list of Silicon Valley companies when they're founded, you know, what's their address and um, some stock information. You know, at this point, it's, it's just data. It's not that interesting or useful, um, certainly not interactive. Um, but you can then query that information, uh, plot these things on Google Maps, show all sorts of different uh, views of that data just by mashing up with the, the various APIs. So here we have, you know, you can click on these different companies and you'll see their last price and some metrics about them. Uh, and then over here on the right, uh, you know, just a, a graph of their price to earnings ratio, right? Just an example of how you can use some of this information. So, um, you know, I'm really looking forward to uh, you guys all joining the groups and becoming part of the community, and I, I want to see what you guys are all building. So catch me later today, and we'll talk about it. Um, do we have any questions? Sure. Um, you talked about the authentication. Um, mm -hmm. I'm working on an app that is a way of posting to your blog from your mobile. Oh, so, sorry. sorry. So you can't actually <coughs> redirect and things like that. Mm -hmm. Is there any way, but obviously the idea is the user signs up for the service and they get, they give us, you know, the credentials there and then, and then we log in and post on their behalf, kind of thing. Um, right. How can I do that without having to store their credentials and log in? Is there any way the user can, you know, sign up, be redirected via their browser, and then I get back a, a token that my server that, that's locked to kind of my server can always post to your server to that user's right. blog, kind of thing? Right. Uh, that's a, uh, definitely something we're looking at. Right now, it's, it's not supported, as I'm sure you found out if you try to look at it. Um, there's, you know, you could try using this authentication token, but that's not going to work for you. It's not long-lived, it expires. So we've had some people run into that before. Um, it's definitely a great feature request, and we're going to look at it and try and, you know, I, I think that will really enable the, the developers to, to leverage the authentication more. Can I ask one more as well? Sure. <laughs> Similar <laughs> images posting to Blogger. Right. <laughs> okay. It's very easy. I've done it in WordPress. It's great. Just one, part one the API has one call for the post, one call for an image. You get back a URL. Right. Uh, so I do know that it's supported using an, an encoding uh, tag. I don't know the details, but I, I think I can point you to it on Google.com. I think there's a knowledge base entry about I it now. I couldn't see anything in the documentation on it. So. Right. Yeah, it's not in the developer guide, yet, but it's a great example. So we'll try and get something in there. It's obviously something people need to do. All right. Anything else? Sure. Um, have you ever considered like kind of open sourcing the, not open sourcing, but encouraging the use of other people to have a GData-like API on their, on their data as well? Because um, I know the Lucene people did one for the Summer of Code last year, and mm -hmm. I did one, I did a quick hack up to, to make a kind of Google Calendar style thing, but it's, it's pretty difficult. Like the documentation is kind of not there. Right. Uh, so that's a good question too, and uh, I think that it's going to be, you know, the, the first quote was basically talking about how you could use GData for any structured data on the internet. And this is something that would help enable that. And this is, you know, the same case where what's good for the developers is good for Google. And I think we're going to try and move in that direction. So thanks for the question. Any more? Sure. In the back. 
I've got uh, two questions. I mean, okay. firstly, related to that, is the G data. I mean, what what what's the license? I mean, in order to use it for your own applications on the server side, so is that an open open source license as well? Um, I'm not exactly sure what the license is as far as using the data. There's different terms of terms of use for the various data services. Sure. Um, but in order to effectively use that same protocol for your own applications. Right, okay, so uh, this is kind of related to your yes. question. It's still, uh, we're still working out what the licensing scheme is gonna be, um, but we're, you know, we're gonna try and make it as open as possible. Right. We wanna encourage people to use it. And the second question I had was on uh, web authentication, mm -hmm. uh, whether it would be, or whether you would consider to um, uh, submit back the email address at least, so that an application could actually attach itself for the authorization. Right, yeah, I think this is uh, similar to an earlier mm -hmm. question. Um, I'm not sure uh, what, where that would be on the timeline, uh, mm -hmm. but it's, it's obviously requested a lot, yeah. and that's, what, that's one of the main drivers for our, for our features going forward, is requests from developers. Thank you. Sure, uh, can we get a mic up here? Do you know how close you are to um, Google Docs API? Uh, I don't actually. Uh, I'm not sure what the what the timeline is for that, if or or where that is in development. Um, is it? I, I'm I'm not really sure actually. Um, but you know, clearly the spreadsheets has been pretty successful. That group is growing, um, and you know it, the goal is to enable as many as we can. So where there's not already a, a solution like with Gmail, there's already solutions for you know retrieving email, like pop three or whatever. Uh, but docs, there's not, so it would be reasonable uh, to create something like that. Sure. Um, another question about authentication, I'm afraid. Yeah. Um, you demonstrated Google applications or other applications authenticating against Google. Have mm -hmm. you considered um, supporting other authentication <coughs> mechanisms, not necessarily for Google's own services, but just in the GData um, protocol in, in general? Say something like OpenID or, or authenticating against another server other than Google? Mm -hmm. Um, that's a good question. We actually ran up against this recently. Uh, we were doing a, we hosted an APP interop at, in Mountain View, and um, it, you know, it turned it turned out that authentication was sort of this hump that developers had to get over because we have our own authentication schemes and we don't support the open ones. Um, so it, again, I just have to say that the feature requests coming in are going to drive that. Um, I'm not sure exactly where it is um, or when they would be releasing that. So keep pestering you. Yes, keep passionate, please. Um, do I have any more? Sure. Uh, just regarding the um, concurrency. Mm -hmm. So um, is it per request or per application? For example, that matters um, for, say, a multi-threaded application. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a single application, but that may have um, uh, multiple requests to, um, for example, um, probably very rare to um, uh, to um, um, events or, or calendar application, but it might be possible for a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. uh, it is per request. Uh, so basically when the server gets the request, that's when it's updating the versioning. Uh, there is, you know, the user agent headers will tell us what application sent the request, uh, but for versioning and concurrency, we don't look at that. Jeez. Okay. Yeah, good question. <coughs> Do you have any more questions? Maybe it's a short session, I think, here. <laughs> Again, thanks for all, thank you all for coming. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff going on today, so look forward to chatting with you later. <laughs>